Great. Well, good evening, everyone. I'm Samir Savant. I'm the festival director of the London Handel Festival. Um, and I'm joined currently by Greg Batsler, who is uh, the musical director of the Huddersfield Choral Society and also a trustee of the London Handel Festival. Um, at the moment, Joseph Fort, who conducts the choir, the Chapel Choir of King's College London, is stuck in traffic, but he is going to join us as soon as possible. So, um, so, you know, I will go ahead with the event and start asking Greg some questions, but we'll, we'll backtrack once Joe is with us. He's very, very apologetic. Apparently he's been stuck for two hours. The journey should have only taken an hour and he's still going, you know, two, two and a bit hours later. Um, I, I just wanted to um, recap a bit about this project, which we're calling Messiah Reimagined. Um, and uh, to, to, to tell you about it, but also just do a few housekeeping things before we, we launch in. Um, on the housekeeping, um, we are recording this event because for those people that are not able to join us, we will upload it to YouTube so all the singers can watch it there. So I hope that's all right with you all. Um, we're on a speaker view. So what um, will be seen on YouTube is the people that are speaking. So while you're, and you're all muted at the moment, um, but um, uh, when it comes to questions, we'll probably take them through the chat function rather than you speaking live onto camera. Um, so don't worry about all of that. Um, it would be nice though if you could say hello on the chat and just let us know where you're from, which choirs you sing with. And I know hopefully we have got people from across the UK, but also people joining us from Ireland and the US. So pick particularly big warm welcome to our international friends. Um, so this project, Messiah Reimagined, um, we, the London Handel Festival, normally do a performance of Messiah on the first Thursday of December in St George's Hanover Square in London's Mayfair, which is Handel's Church. And that's with our Baroque Orchestra, Soloists, the Choir of St George's at Hanover Square. And that's a very traditional performance. And I'm sure many of you also um, give your own Christmas performances of Messiah. This year we can't do that because in the UK we're in lockdown and live performances with audiences are, are not allowed and we wouldn't have been able to fit all of the musicians, including the chorus, into the space and have two metres between all of the musicians. So we decided to to kind of um, reimagine it as Mr. Handel would. He would be very proud and impressed by how we've come up with this creative digital solution. So on the 3rd of December, the orchestra will still be performing live with soloists from St. George's Hanover Square, so Handel's Church, um, but all of the choruses have been pre-recorded by either one of our choral partners. Um, so we're working with Huddersfield Choral Society, the Chapel Choir of King's College London, uh, North London Chorus and Finchley uh, Choral Society together, and Tiffin School and Pimlico Musical Foundation together and this amazing choir, this Sing at Home choir, which comprises 150 singers from 16 countries across five continents. So we're really bringing together this wonderful community, international community of people that love Handel's Messiah and singing it all. The whole performance on the 3rd of December will be live streamed. So you will all be able to watch it. It will probably be hosted on our Facebook channel um, and also live streamed on YouTube. Um, but what I will do in the next few days is set up a Facebook event. So if you want, if you've got people that are interested, um, I know not everyone is on Facebook, but most people are. So you can point your friends and family towards this particular event and that's where we will host it from. Um, so that's about the project itself. Um, the great news is that it's been so uh, successful and positive that we are going to do it all again. And we're going to do it on Easter Monday, 2021, again from Handel's Church, again working with a range of choral partners and again with our Sing at Home choir who will prepare those three same three choruses and the Glory, Hallelujah Chorus and Worthy is the Lamb. Um, uh, fingers crossed that we've got Yeston Davis, who's very well known to many of you as our alto soloist. And I'm just recruiting other amazing soloists to join us for that concert. So it would be wonderful if you wanted to sing with us again on that occasion. And also, please let all your choir singing friends know about this, because I think this um, 
this um, kind of hold on a live singing activity is going to go on for several months. And although this isn't perfect, it's uh, the next best thing we've got to singing together. And I hope when you see your faces and hear your voices in this digital project on the 3rd of December, it will really inspire you to want to tell your friends about it. So we want an even bigger choir, Sing at Home Choir, for next time around. So please be thinking about people that you could ask. And we will, um, the details are already, some of the details are already on our website, but we will send you all links and everything so you can direct people. Um, how we're going to run this event today is I've got a series of questions I'm going to ask Greg and eventually Joe, Joe when he joins us um, and but we're going to leave plenty of time at the end for questions from you and again if you put them into the chat and I will see if they're similar questions of a similar theme which I'll put to the the two conductors um, or indeed individual questions you, you might have as well so so please be thinking about the questions you might wish to ask um, and the whole session is uh, around an hour, so we'll, we'll be done by 7.15. Um, but it's great to have you all here. Um, it's wonderful that you're all part of this Im impressive and engaging project. So thank you for that. So, Greg, welcome. <laughs> um, my first question to you really was, when I started talking to you about this project, your initial thought about this project? I mean, did it seem like utter madness and lunacy at the time? Or did you kind of think, this is exactly the kind of project I've been wanting to be involved with? Well, well what's really interesting, well, hello folks, nice to see or meet you all, albeit virtually on Zoom. Um, and I'm, as Simon said, I'm really thrilled to be part of this project, both as a trustee of the festival, but also as the music director of um, the Huddersfield Chorus Society. Um, um, when F Samuel first started to talk to me about this project, I guess my initial reaction was one of kind of curiosity. And what's quite interesting is how the musical landscape has changed such that I now fully understand what a virtual online Messiah performance is. And I think that's been one of the most remarkable things about the last eight months is that music has had to get to grips with online and media performance more than it ever has done so when Sammy first began talking about this project which would have probably been Sammy you can correct me if I'm wrong but probably around July I expect if not maybe a little bit earlier than that the kind of the the ideas of virtual choirs and big online performances of lots of different groups seemed almost unimaginable at that point but it's definitely something that I was interested in and something I felt um being working for the Huddersfield Choral Society was something that might be appealing to them given their association with this great piece. So I think initially there was a definitely a feeling of intrigue when you were telling me about it. And then we've seen over the last eight months, all music organizations from very small choirs to very large international organizations embracing technology in a way that they never had done. And this performance really said, seems to me as one of the cutting edge versions of doing that. And we definitely wanted to be a part of it. Brilliant. Thank you, Greg. And in terms of Huddersfield Choral Society, what have you been up to during lockdown during these past few months? So, I mean, I can see that I've got some of the Choral Society members actually on the chat, so it's nice to see them. Um, what have we been doing? So it's been a kind of a mixed bag with, with them. Initially, we started meeting on Zoom in the kind of late spring and summer and we have a wonderful vocal coach um, with, with, with the Choral Society who's, who was doing online vocal coaching sessions with the choir and then intermittently I was taking the choir through a sort of hist a potted history of um, sort of Western choral music starting really with the origins a kind of bird and pre-bird and taking us right up to contemporary music and that that really kind of quenched our thirst sufficiently in the spring and summer and then what we've been trying to do and what we've been working on in the last few months in, in the autumn is a project that we're really excited about actually is a project um with it which involves a collaboration with the poet laureate simon armitage um and what we've done is we've commissioned simon armitage to write two poems um which have been inspired by the words of the members of the choir so the members of the choir submitted a word to simon armitage and um a word that reflected their experiences of lockdown um, and their experiences of being without singing. And then from those words, the Poet Laureate then created two um, brand new poems, which are really, really beautiful, actually, uh, and very, very touching. And um, the Poet Laureate, and then, and then we've asked two exciting um, young composers, Daniel Kidane and um, Cheryl Francis Hode, to write 
um, brand new pieces of music. So this all took place over the summer. And then for the last couple of months, we've been rehearsing these works. And then a week ago, we actually were able to record them. And we record, we went, we came into uh, the church right in the middle of Huddersfield, which is actually quite an amazing, uh, kind of, you wouldn't expect a church of such beauty to be right where it is. And we came into that church and section by section recorded it, recorded these two pieces. And we're working with a, a film company to create two brand new music videos that will be launching into the world just not just before actually the, the, the virtual messiah happens so that's been that's really been something that's been occupying us and it's been a project that i think we've all benefited from and we were we were fortunate that we could have about six weeks of well four weeks of singing together in person since it's all changed and now you know we're all back on zoom and figuring out how to make music on zoom again Yes, yes, indeed. And I, I suppose a follow up question is that, you know, music really has helped a lot of us, you know, with our emotional well-being, our mental well-being and this sense of kind of connection. But, you know, even the people that are on this call, we're all part of a community together. So hopefully and, and, and it, it leads to a kind of a visceral reaction. You know, and I, I've taken part in virtual choir things for the last few months. And, and obviously nothing can replace being in the same space as other singers, but it's still a very powerful thing to just, you know, be able to fill, fill your lungs and use your larynx and your diaphragm and just the physical act of singing again. Yeah, I think one of the most powerful things about singing in a choir is contributing to, is being a small part in a large thing or being, you know, is, is the sense of teamwork, is the sense of togetherness that you get from being in a choir and, the sense of contributing and knowing that my voice is bringing something to something much greater, you know, um, that, that, that occurs whether you're singing uh, solo trios or whether you're singing in, in large symphonic choruses, your voice is contributing to amazing pieces of art. And, that, and that's one of the fundamentally most powerful things about singing in these choirs, you know, is, is, the, is the feeling of contribution. And as you rightly say, it's the feeling of community. And I think as, as, as much as we all recognize that singing virtual choirs has its limitations and and that, you know I, I always think we must be careful not to always compare i think virtual choir stands on its own now as an as as a type of choral um experience you know we if we if we, if we try to immediately compare doing a virtual choir with singing with our, our colleagues and the virtual choir won't stand up but what we have learned in this time is that actually we can create this thing called a virtual choir that we as singers, amateurs or professionals can contribute to in, in, in a similar way and produce something really great. So I think, I think um, yeah, I think virtual choirs have found an interesting part of the market, so to speak, actually. And, and I think as singers who are singing in it, it does help us maintain that feeling and, um, in, and, and, and cultivate that feeling of contribution and also community. And um, I mean, I am looking forward to this, this actually is the first major virtual choir project that I've been part of actually in, in uh, since, since the pandemic began and we kind of saw a, a, a spring of virtual choirs uh, kind of emerge. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I am really looking forward to seeing how it goes and seeing the members of our choir singing the courses that we're doing, but also seeing the people from, um, from the kind of come and sing, uh, the kind of sing from home group singing. So I'm, I am, I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing how it goes. I have no doubt it's going to be stunning and very exciting. So, yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah. And um, to reassure everyone on the call, um, there's some amazing technical people um, behind all of this as well, kind of stitching it all together. Um, the Huddersfield Choral Society have used people that, themselves, but in terms of the All Comers Choir, um, we've got a chap, very talented young man, Alex James, who's done a lot of the Rodolphus Choir virtual events, um, which I've sung in myself. Uh, and very, you know, very accomplished. And, the, you know, I've heard some of the uh, the early edits, if you like, and everything's sounding great. I mean, there's no doubt that people are amateur voices, you know, they're untrained voices. So it has a particular tone and blend. But it's like they're it's like you, everyone on a really good day. <laughs> it's like amateur voices, but very well directed because essentially all the blemishes have been edited out um, and you're hearing this kind of solid sound. All the consonants are exactly in the right place. So it's really quite impressive. Um, and just sticking with virtual choirs, Greg, I mean, what, you know, what are the kind of pros and cons? I mean, I'm, I'm a very positive person. And I think when you see yourself, very few of us have actually seen ourselves on, on the screen singing. But yeah. when you see yourself singing, you are aware of what you look like. 
uh, and obviously you hear your own voice um many people for the first time and you kind of you you first of is is kind of the shock and the horror if you like oh my god is that really what i'd look like is that really what i sound like but once you get over that initial barrier um you can really work on it you can really work on you know the your mouth shape and how you look and all this kind of thing is is that some as a choral trainer is that something you agree with what I actually found it was quite staggering when we were able to come back to rehearsing in person in September or late September in October in Huddersfield was actually, I found that a lot of the singers had really improved technically through this time. Um, and I think there has been a real benefit to being, being watching yourself do something, you know, um, uh, for singers that they can see how the mechanisms working and, they, it has given us a space to really work a technique. And I think that is, a, as you've said, I think it's certainly a benefit from doing virtual choirs. I think it also will help us as singers become more conscientious. And, you know, I think doing a virtual choir naturally will mean that people, well, one would hope that people who are submitting any entrance for this are going to be conscientious about what they're submitting, you know, and therefore it makes people be, proud and take responsibility for the music that they're offering and, and I think every choir in the world and every choir director in the world is constantly trying to encourage the singers in their choirs to take responsibility for the for the lines that they're singing and take individual responsibility and I think a virtual choir can certainly enhance those skills and then I think finally one of the things that I know you, a kind of classic choral director phrase to shout at a choir, which I, I find a bit difficult, is, you know, you just make sure you always watch and you know, look up and make sure you're communicating with the audience. And often I think people don't quite, I think those phrases can get quite lost in translation because people, often there's, a, there's, a, there's an inherent reason why people don't look up, which is because either they, they're not really connected with the tech, what the text is, or B, they don't know the music well enough. And, you know, it's, there's, there's lots of reasons why people don't just, look up and I think choral that is barking at choirs telling us to look up is not really a solution. However, I think with virtual choirs, given the kind of front facing nature of the fact it's all being projected, it is going to help us hone those skills of presentation, you know, and I think it's one thing that every choir in the world must constantly be looking to improve, which is this idea of presentation. You know, we are performers on a stage presenting to an audience and I think doing, um, doing this, a virtual choir like this will help us, help us kind of improve our skills like that, yeah. Great, great. So what, what would you see as the, the, the biggest downsides? I mean, obviously not singing together, not hearing other voices, not being able to breathe together, all those kind of technical things, but anything kind of more top, top level as well? Um, I, I think the, the difficulty that we all have to embrace about being online is it, it, it is we lose just a little bit of interaction um you know and we can't hear as a conductor i can't hear when we're zooming doing zoom stuff we can't hear the other person sing so there's a level of trust that we're having to nurture um and i, and I think you know one of the things that's most powerful about choral singing is is the collective interpretation of something right and i think one of the things that I'm excited to discover through virtual choirs is how we can still ensure that we have a collective interpretation, you know, and often when a choir is singing at a very high level, whatever choir is singing at a high level, it's because the people all together are listening to each other and, and feeding from each other's energies around each other um, and trying to do the same um, kind of dramatic interpretation of a piece, creating the same sounds together. And I think, to do that in a virtual choir is harder because you don't have the initial people around you to respond to, nor do you have the conductor's beat directly to relate to. And I think what this virtual choir project has done really well through the videos with Lawrence is maintain some sort of musical direction that hopefully will create a coherent interpretation. But I think it is interpretation that kind of the collective sense of togetherness and interpretation that I think is, is, is a challenge for sure for virtual mm -hmm. choirs and, it's quite, it's quite easy to do tempi, but I, I, you know, I think interpretation is much, much greater than decisions on tempi. It's, it's much to do with feeding in ideas about what the music represents that we can all then use our voices to interpret. I hope that's not too highbrow as a thought. Well, I mean, I mean, picking up on that also, because um, not only is this 
project all virtual choirs, but all different choirs as well. Yeah. So to get a sense of cohesion in the whole of the piece uh, is tricky, isn't it? And, and one hopes that in the editing, there would be a, a kind of sense. And as you say, there's the continuity of the fact that it's the same yeah. orchestra playing and the same overall musical director in the form of Lawrence Cummings. Yeah. And on the flip side, I mean, you could also argue that I think um, one of the beauties about this piece and the way you've done it is it is, does give each organisation an opportunity, each partner choir and also the, the Sing From Home choir to be able to offer their own little flavour of how we do Messiah. You know, for example, mm -hmm. at Huddersfield, we have our, our kind of in-house style about how we want to do Messiah and the certain quirks that we have about in the way we sing it. And I hope in our own little way, not just our kind of broad northern accents, but, you know, in, in, in some of the passion that we want to portray the music in, that will also come through in the virtual choir. So as much as it, it may be as restrictive in terms of collective, it is nice to see individual groups have their personality given the bit of a, a, a spotlight. Yeah, no, that's great. That's great. And, th and that kind of leads me nicely on to my next question, which is, why do you think Messiah has such an enduring popularity with singers? I mean, it's written in text from, you know, 250 years ago. It's religious music, which isn't necessarily in tune with many people's way of thinking these days. And it's it's Baroque music. You know, it's not it's absolutely not contemporary at all. But and yet, you know, choirs all over the world are singing this piece every year and can't keep coming back to it. Yeah. What is it about the piece, do you think? Uh, it's the greatest piece of music ever written. I mean, I mean, it, 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 I, I could talk to you for hours about this piece of music and not get bored of, of it. I think, what is it about Messiah that makes it so popular? Well, first of all, you start with the composer. Um, and he is the greatest songwriter of all time. You know, he, he is the ultimate melody writer. Now, if you were to bring Handel into the 21st century today, he would be commissioned by all the great songwriters in the world to write melodies for them. He'd probably be commissioned by Andrew Lloyd Webber. He would have surpassed Andrew Lloyd Webber. You know, he'd be a multi, multi-billionaire old running theatres and stuff because he, the guy could just create a great tune. So that, that for, and, and I think Messiah has some of his best tunes, but I mean, what's amazing about him is then you go on to another oratorio and then you go, oh, well, actually, hang on a minute, Theodora, that's got some bangers as well. and. But his tunes aren't that complex, you know? It's sort of, hallelujah. Ha. It's not particularly complex, but he just, like all great songwriters, he is able to create some kind of beauty and stuff out of relative simplicity, you know? Um, so that's the first thing I think I'd say, is that he's just, a, a, you we're working with a genius composer here. Um, and not only is he great at writing for melodies, but he's also, there's a very famous singing teacher, a singing teacher called Pat McMahon, who says that basically Handel's music is like medicine for the voice. And he just has a way of writing that singers enjoy singing, you know. And it's a real skill of a composer, not only to write music that audiences want to listen to, but also that m musicians want to perform. Now, there's probably 20 in the history of Western classical music that can do this. You know, Bach is even struggles to do this, because I think at times musicians get frustrated with the difficulty of Bach. But with Handel, it, it just feels so beautifully natural to perform it, you know. Um, so that's why I think partly it has so much popularity because it's just so much fun to perform. And I think the other thing to perhaps mention about Messiah that I think, well, another thing to mention about it is the choice of libretto is quite unique. It, it you know, it's like the ultimate musical biopic in the sense that it's, you know, it's, it's the story of God's <laughs> incarnate within four hours you know it's, it's like a movie it, three hours or two depending on who's conducting it but you know this piece is like a movie and and, and the, the way in which him and the, the librettist Jenners have managed to sort of put this piece together is 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 absolutely genius the pacing of it is extraordinary and I you know I I often get asked to conduct this piece and I get asked, well, what are my cuts? And I just say, there aren't any. You don't need, if you get the pacing right, you shouldn't need any cuts in this piece. I mean, we might be doing cuts in this, I'm not aware, and apologies if I'm treading on things that say that I shouldn't, but you know, it, it, just the pacing of it works like a great piece of cinematography in, in, in the same way that The Godfather just works as a piece of cinema. And the pacing of it is extraordinary. You, and you go back to it and you find new things in it that the, um, the the kind of 
way the Messiah is paced, both by the words and the music, also um, is extraordinary. And I think, you know, it's the other thing that's key is it's not a kind of classic religious text. It doesn't, it's not really got, a, it's not a mass, for example, or it's not a kind of overly saturated sort of specific story from the Bible that's often overused. You know, we, we, we touch on a lot of the narrative of Passion Tide in it, but it, it looks both beyond and before, you know, and I think it has such great metaphorical resonance in a secular society, you know. That's what I also think is so brilliant about this piece, that it, it's, though it is clearly God heavy, and you know, the thing's called Messiah, for goodness sake, you know, you can't, you, there's no escaping God at any point in this piece. But Handel doesn't, like, unlike some composers, who you sometimes think, oh, just give it a rest, would you? Yeah, I believe, or I don't believe. You know, you just think, you know, they've kind of rammed God down your throat, potentially. I think he, Handel is his kind of, his, his, there's a humility to the way he writes that allows us as an audience or a singer to be able to reflect upon the music and the text in ways where we can make up our own minds. You know, some of the, some of the themes of redemption or love or persecution or joy or birth these are things that we have in today's society you know we, we all know what we well a lot of us know what it's like to experience the birth of a new child be it from a friend or be it from a, a, a partner or whatever and you know and the glory of the lord has within it that excitement you know and sometimes we know what it feels like to be really sad since by man came death is so sad you know but, and we also know what it's like to be contemplative. And, and I just think he, he, in this piece, he, he manages to touch on most, you know, the most kaleidoscopic range of emotions that um, any composer has ever done. And I, yeah, I just think it, I could, you see what I mean? I'm just getting excited talking about it. I think it's <laughs> amazing. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. No, and, and just picking up on that narrative, I mean, uh, you know, if, if you, whether you believe or not that Jesus Christ was the son of God, it is about, a man it's the story of a man as you say and the the, the birth of the child and then the, the the you know he was despised and being rejected by society and then the ultimate uh, redemption and the, the hope um, the overriding hope I, I know that my redeemer liveth you know so it so it does have this beautiful narrative arc and actually i think that's interesting i think he doesn't I and mean, i've just realized this you know you it, he doesn't make you sort of sign up to being a christian it's just he's telling a story in and in the same way that you could, you know, um, you could you could watch a great film about a character, or you know, you could watch Lord of the Rings and get a lot from the characters in, Lord, or read Lord of the Rings, get a lot from the characters in that. I think Handel does the same. And unlike in a few of his other oratorio, which often end with a sort of similarish chorus where they go, "Oh well, let's forget all the bad, but if we all believe in God, it'll all be okay." is how most of his works end. And with with Messiah, he doesn't sort of give you that caveat at the end. It's, you know, we, he doesn't sort of say, well, um, we all have to sort of sign up and become believers. It just says, this is a great story. Amen. Thank you very much. You know, it's, it's it's utter genius and it will and i think it'd be a piece that will surpass us forever and ever and ever amen <laughs> <laughs> and you um you neatly um bring me to my final question from me so just to the floor please, please be getting your questions ready for greg i'm really sorry about joseph i mean he he's clearly stuck in terrible traffic still he's he's absolutely distraught about it all but um you know hopefully he will be able to join us at some point on this call um but uh or, or we could i could always ask some of these questions to him directly and then he will put them uh, in an email and we can share all of that with you afterwards um but please uh, those people who are tuned in uh, if you have your questions ready for for greg um but my last um, question to you, Greg, is, and you were touching on it just towards the end, is what is the future for this piece, do you think? Oh, I mean, I, I think there's a great future for this piece. I think uh, the future for this piece, and I think the future for a lot of choral music, is to continue to explore how it can have relevance outside of a sacred um, space. You know, and I, I think one of the things that's brilliant about the London Handel Festival is it's able to perform Handel in Handel's church. And that's one of the things that's so special about that. And that's one thing to be encouraged. But I think 
the future of this piece i mean there's been lots of people who've done like sir andrew davis has done a very quirky arrangement of it which involves marimbas and saxophones which isn't necessarily my cup of tea to be honest um i honestly think this piece needs little help for it to have a future to be honest with you i think ultimately it's I think it, it's just so good that choirs will just naturally, will naturally fall in love with it when they sing it. And I, you know, one of the things I do really envy is someone listening to this piece or singing this piece for the first time. You know, every year we do this piece probably with the, with, with the, with the Huddersfield Chorus Society. And there might be, what, five or six people who've joined the choir that year who've never sung it. And I think, God, how lucky are you to be doing this for the first time in your life? Or, you know, and people in the audience who are listening to this piece for the first time in its life. I think... With all music, we have to constantly look to evolve the way we sing things. We have to look to evolve its meaning. Now, society will evolve alongside this piece. So the mean, the kind of metaphorical meaning of it will change. That's the natural evolution of art, isn't it? That our interpretations of it change because of what society has to say. And, you know, what I'm really excited to see is what this piece goes on to mean. And I think it would be really exciting to see it have a virtual choir performance like this and see how it, it's home and I have I'm really I'm really looking forward to seeing how it finds its home on the internet like this and um, and I'm sure other groups will continue to explore it in their own way I think I personally have this grand I'm, I'm not many people know this but I might as well share it I've got this sort of vision um, that some major like film producer um, and director would kind of get hold of Messiah and they would basically do the most beautiful Netflix series and that every like kind of scene, because it's broken up into scenes, isn't it? That every scene was given like to a different director and would be kind of created into this beautiful, not necessarily even with pe seeing people singing, but you just created this sort of, I don't really know, kind of ornate sort of art cinema. And, you know, I just have, I think it would be really, I think it could lend to a, a piece of cinema quite easily. So, um, yeah, that's. I hope that sort of kind of answers the question somehow. Yes, no, that that's great. I mean, it, it's it's uh, going back to the original point about the the strong narrative and the fact that it's uh, it appeals to to all of humanity. Okay, so over to to everyone there. No one's asked a question yet, so I'm rapidly trying to think of something to ask Greg in the <laughs> meantime. Um, but please don't be shy. Please do come forward. And um, um, okay, so we have one from Peter Carlyle. When when we finally are able to sing together again, do you see an ongoing role for virtual singing and choirs? And if so, where do you see that fitting? Oh, and we've got Joe as well, apparently. So I will bring him in. But, oh, hi, Joe. Hi, see you. hi, Greg. Hi, everybody. I'm so sorry. I'm so late. I've just had a three hour, five minute journey home, uh, in which time I think I could probably have driven to Huddersfield. <laughs> so, uh, so many, many apologies, but lovely to see everybody. Um, what I might do, so, so that uh, I'll, um, while you're getting your breath, Joe, I'll ask that question to Greg first and then to you, and I'll come back and revisit some of my previous questions because I'm sure you'll have some interesting things to say. But wh when we can all sing again, Greg, um, will there still be a role for virtual choirs? And w what particular, how does that all fit into everything else, do you think? Uh, I think it's a, 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 an actually a brilliant question. Uh, and I know Pete and um, always ask a brilliant question. Um, do I see a role for virtual choirs? Yes, I do um, see a role for virtual choirs. I think it will help uh, bridge the international choral community. And I think, um, I think the virtual choir, as we now see it, will probably evolve considerably now. Um, I think we've set something in motion. I think there were some groups were sort of fiddling with it for, have been fitting with it for a few years and now a lot of groups are embracing it and I think what we now see as a virtual choir will be unrecognisable in a few years actually and I'm sure technology will evolve quite rapidly around us um, to kind of keep improving the experience and I, and I think the place for it will be you know if for example um, I do an annual come and sing with the Royal Scottish National Orchestra and um, you know we can use virtual choirs to go and get into the rest of the world for that event, a bit like you're doing here. So I do, I think it will help broaden the international community for sure. And that's, that's only a positive thing, really. Great. And um, Joe, kind of same question to you, but related to a previous question I asked Greg, is that are virtual choirs here to stay? 
Uh, and related to that, what, Joe, do you, because you've been doing quite a lot of virtual choir stuff with Kings London already, the Chapel Choir of Kings. So if you could explain a bit what you've been doing and through that process, what do you see as the kind of pros and cons of this kind of virtual choir model? Mm. I mean, I think and the only thing I would add to um, uh, to uh, what Greg has said about about um, virtual choirs, which I do think are here to say, uh, stay, is that um, it's, I think the... The last few months also um, choral societies have been able to reach out sometimes to former members who for whatever reason can't still go to um, go to rehearsals they might have moved out of the area or they might not um, uh, they might not be able to to um, uh, to, to travel to, to, to rehearsals and actually it's sort of um, uh, the the sort of general um, Upping of, of our online presence overall has has sort of brought a lot of you know a, a significant number of people um, back kind of into into the fold and into the into the community and I think that um, that as people become more comfortable with these and the the technology of them I think that that's actually going to um, uh, you know also also sort of be be um, be an access point for for um, for 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 people who might not ne necessarily be able to be uh, present physically um, uh, in rehearsals uh, and performances. And we have, we actually haven't done a, a huge amount of, um, of virtual choir um, things with, with Kings because actually we've been, um, we've been um, getting smaller portions of the choir present um, in, in the chapel uh, in, in various combinations and have been um, live streaming some, some services that way. But we have done um, one or two. And uh, the, I mean, the, the main one we did was, uh, was Os Justi, Bruckner's Os Justi. Um, and it was to go out during, um, uh, during uh, sort of graduation period last last summer um and i actually found it um i must admit that i'd been slightly skeptical of um of virtual choirs up to that point um so much of the process is so different to what we're we're used to doing um and and so much of it is actually quite uh uh, quite it, it can be i thought um quite quite sterile you're sort of singing at a piece of plastic it's just you there and and um and, and you're just sort of surrounded by these electronic things um and, and it's just so different to being you know having people singing on either side of you and that sort of thing but actually um i was uh the I was sort of totally convinced by the final product which especially because it was um it was after probably four months or five months of of, uh, of of no singing with the choir and just seeing all these students singing so um so expressively and so um uh, and so musically actually um was that it was actually really really moving and the final product i was actually um far 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 more convinced by than i'd originally thought i'd thought i'd be Great, thanks, Joe. And then a, a supplementary question to you, and picking up on what Greg was saying before, we were talking about the enduring popularity of the piece and, and why it, it continues to be popular. Um, and of course, with with King's Chapel Choir, a lot of your young singers are singing the piece for the first time. And Greg was saying he's quite envious of people either singing the piece for the first time or hearing it for the first time. And in a way, you, with all your new undergraduates each year, you're getting people that probably haven't sung it. And I've personally witnessed because um, as part of the uh, London Handel Festival, we work with King's, the Chapel Choir of King's London, and they do their own performance of Messiah at Christmas with our London Handel Orchestra. So I wondered if you could say something about that, Joe, the, the, the particular joy there is in, in the energy and hearing it sung by singers who are singing it for the first time. And um, mm. with those young singers, do you feel that, how, how do they react? I mean, does that explain the enduring popularity of the piece? That's a, that's a, a really interesting question and it's actually i mean when we do it it's most actually i'd say most of the of the new singers each year haven't sung it before it's, it's new for pretty much all of them um and we've been doing this for for, for, for a couple of years now and, and it's always the the been the case um and that's it sort of it it's interesting it um the thing that i um 
think uh, the, where well the moment I think you feel it the um, the most sort of intensely with them is actually when you when we get to the performance because uh, obviously we've been learning this this long piece in over probably about five weeks and fitting it in with all the with services and everything else that that have been going on and carol services by that point and and other concerts and you um you you get to the concert day and and suddenly we, that's the first time we do the whole thing all the way through is in the concert and you get to those those final movements and 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 we've got our um in the in the London Handel Orchestra the 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 trumpets and the timpani are sort of pounding away but we've 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 had this sort of journey for for the best part of three hours because we've we um. Uh, we we do very very few cuts. We do pretty much the the, the whole thing, um, and that is the moment I think um, where um, where where just everybody feels. Oh yeah, w what a piece and and what an experience um, as well. And I think that is not just us, but also the um, uh, that's the, what kind of also brings us to the the audience experience of of this of this piece as well i think and and why do you think i mean you know i, I asked greg this before but you know here we are several centuries later the music the, the the music is baroque music obviously and um the language is an archaic form of english that we don't use anymore so with your young singers how through through what kind of reactions do you get from them why do you think the piece is still popular today it's enduring popularity and related question what is the future for the piece do you think um part of it is um uh i'm sure because the, the because essentially actually because we 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 say oh isn't this, this is a great piece and this and we kind of build this buzz around it um but there's also something about the piece intrinsically i think that is is um is uh is is brilliant and and i wish i could put my um finger on, on what it was because because then or, or one of us could because then then surely we, we we'd write another and, uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, uh but um yeah i don't i mean i don't know is the is the honest answer and in terms of the 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 future of the piece i think actually this yeah this sort of um uh move uh, everything going online is probably going to be one of the um the, the really big kind of shakeups that it that it um that it that it goes uh, that it goes through because actually um, it seems if you think about kind of broad um, musical activities in in a town or so, or, or, or or a city or or, or or a village or somewhere it's one of those things I think actually the kind of annual sing along Messiah or come and sing Messiah that, that has sort of endured um, while a lot of other musical activities that that town or city or, or village might have changed quite a lot or or, um, or gone and so in a sense it's kind of a, a lodestone where, where the, the same thing has happened and um, uh, and and actually you know, it was done by a lot of the 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 same people and um and so i think actually it, you know if we think about it it's um it's one of those pieces that hasn't necessarily practices around it haven't necessarily changed all that much and actually this is the the moment where where in some ways in some ways they are changing now great thank you thanks um so folks uh, please do come forward with more more questions if you'd like i've got one one for greg now i mean related to what joe was just saying that you know messiah is kind of a cornerstone of our not just of um you know audiences and singers but just our culture you know it's such a british thing isn't it uh, even though you know on this call we've got international people but in this country we're very proud of it and and greg you know huddersfield do sing it every year and it's become one of those kind of real traditions i suspect you've got generations of you know grandparents parents and grandchildren going along and watching you know auntie pat or uncle jim or whoever in the chorus singing it and it's become this kind of great family tradition or, or synonymous almost with, with christmas um i mean what about that point about uh, you know it, it seems to be a great leveler as well doesn't it you don't have to necessarily 
be a great Handel connoisseur or really into classical music to in, enjoy Messiah. Is, is, is that your experience with Huddersfield Choral Society? Because you do, you have done it for so many years. I mean, stretching back decades and decades. Yeah, centuries even. Um, uh, you know, I think the Messiah for Huddersfield is, you know, you, the, the two are synonymous really. Um, you know, it, it, the, it I recorded with Sir Malcolm Sargent, um, and I think it was in the sort of mid 20th century that sort of went global is what really put Huddersfield Choral Society on the map. Um, and I think what, I, I mean, I remember this journey. I was having, I was taking a, a train from, um, uh, it must have been Manchester to Scotland, and I was sat actually studying the score of Messiah in preparation for a performance with the Choral Society a couple of years ago now. And someone said to me on the train, what are you doing? And I, you know, often, I don't know if you get this, Joe, but if you've got your music on the train, people want to talk to you. It's a bad, 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 bad part of being studying music. People want to talk to you. Um, and, you know, and then you sort of say, well, actually, I'm doing this piece called Messiah. And it, and it turned out that this chap was, he couldn't believe it. And I couldn't believe it either, but he basically just booked tickets to come and see the performance of Messiah with Huddersfield in the Huddersfield Town Hall and have been doing it for cent like for decades with his whole family. And I think what we do with our performance of Messiah is really cultivate that sense of community with our audience. Uh, you know, it's, it is an event that means something deeply um, in the community. For many, it's, it's definitely this kind of starting pistol for Christmas. Um, but it's also a, a, a moment of kind of really beautiful music that just happens in a part of the world that doesn't have a great wealth. I mean, it, to be fair, it has a lot of things in Leeds and Manchester around it, but you know, in Huddersfield itself, there isn't a great wealth of um, kind of high, high level core activity. And this one time a year, this great piece of music gets performed. And for some reason, it's just captured the imagination of, of the town and the people around it. And long may that continue really. Great, thanks, Craig. So you're very quiet lot. You're not asking any questions. We've only had the ones so far. Um, so I'll keep looking on the chat to see. Um, but just to remind, uh, I know we've had a few people come late onto the call, but just to remind you all that on the 3rd of December, um, all of our choral partners and our Sing at Home Choir all those contributions, those pre-recorded contributions will be live streamed alongside our live orchestra and soloists. And it will be done essentially as a Facebook event, um, but with, um, you know, uh, digital distribution on, on YouTube as well. And also um, it will stay there on YouTube. We'll send you the link. So if people can't watch it, I know there's so many of you, as I said before, 150 singers in 16 countries across five continents. So it's not going to be conducive from time zone point of view to all be watching it at 7 p.m. Uh, Greenwich Mean Time. But you can watch it later and you can send it to people. So we're, we're very proud of, of, of what that will be. Um, um, Joe, is there anything you wanted to say about the piece or your approach to it with your chapel choir? As we've, um, we've heard a lot from Greg already, so. All, I mean, all I'd say is that it's one of those pieces that actually it's, so in the, um, this term, always the, the first term of the year uh, with, with, a, um, with a student choir um, that, uh, you know, of which a third is, is replaced um, and you're, you're rebuilding, um, you're, this term is always the, um, the, the building term where you're, you're getting things in place, training, uh, training a lot. And that's something that, um, that struck me particularly about this piece um, this year that, that hadn't struck me quite so much it, because we've been doing uh, one or two of the quite fast um, choruses that it, it really is a, um, a bit like the, the Bach motet. It's one of those pieces that, um, that you, you feed a choir and they come out and, and it, they've, um, they've noticeably um, uh, uh, made, made some, some strides in their, in their vocal technique from having to do all of this. And this term, because of the way we've been set up, sort of splitting the choir into smaller groups, um, some aspects of the of the of the training have been much 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 harder to accomplish you've just been trying to get get 
enough ready for even song that evening and and sort of push everyone through that and and, I, and it's been much harder to get that kind of long term uh, or um, long term development going and so i think that it's just that aspect of the messiah and and this particular project that has um uh, been quite striking i think this time around great thanks okay so final question from me then and then we'll kind of wrap this whole event up thank you everyone for taking part um to both of you um starting maybe with with you joe but and greg, greg mentioned when we were talking about the enduring popularity of this piece one of it is is just it's such a great piece to sing um and for me I, i've sung this piece as a treble and a tenor haven't quite made it down to, to bass yet but i'm sure that's uh, in the future um but for, for me it's just it is incredibly beautiful to sing and the melodies are lovely to sing and you end up just humming a lot of it you know even sub, sub, you know subconsciously um but it's a sense of achievement as well it's kind of when you get to that kind of for the sopranos and tenors that top a and the end of the amen and you really pace yourself and you deliver it um but it's not it's not as greg has said before it's not like bach where you sometimes think he's writing for instruments not for the voice and this stuff is just fiendish and there's just no way that I, you know, my larynx, my diaphragm, my, you know, I can cope with all of this, my brain. But with Handel, you get a feeling that he's on your side and he just wants you to do really well. Uh, but you can't shirk. You know, if you're going to do this stuff properly, you really do have to be, you know, to really do everything that we're, we're told by our, our teachers and our coaches. You know, you do have to engage your diaphragm. You do have to think about the shape of your mouth for vowels. And you do have to think about, you know, um, getting the meaning across and the consonants and all this kind of thing. So asking you, Joe, then, do, do you agree? I mean, are, are there particular aspects of the piece that you think are just very good for choral training and for getting us to really up our game as singers? Yeah, I mean, the, the one that comes immediately to mind is that um, uh, Bach, and it's a very kind of uh, basic thing, but, but Bach tends to be, I think, kinder in doubling fast notes in the instruments um whereas in uh, whereas Handel will quite often um uh, just leave the the sopranos or whatever singing the on their own nothing uh, nothing uh, no support from from the players all the players doing something totally different um they're they're exposed i think in a way that um uh, that that happens less i think with with Bach Great. And, and Greg, for, from you as well as a, as a choral, I mean, Joe's got a kind of fairly small chapel choir. You've got a much bigger choral society. And yet those kind of the essence of Handel and, and being engaging your diaphragm, engaging your larynx properly to be able to sing Handel properly. Any thoughts from you uh, as a director of several choral societies? Um, I, I think the pacing is, is, is definitely... A good thing about the piece, a, a good thing to learn from it. I think storytelling, that's that's really uh, something that I think the piece can teach you. Um, and it's really a philosophy of mine, for sure, that if we have a collective approach to storytelling, then actually the rest of the stuff, you know, we can work at technique, we can work at intonation and tuning, but it, 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 it's by capturing our imaginations in terms of storytelling as a collective ensemble, um, that we can then all the other stuff kind of looks after itself and i think that is what this piece can help us learn actually i mean so obviously can the, the bach passions but this piece has so much joy sprinkled within it that i think it really kind of it, it just it encourages great singing at all times i would say Brilliant. Great. Well, on behalf of you all, may I thank warmly um, Greg Batzler and Joseph Fort uh, for joining us on this call. Um, our next event uh, is going to be on Thursday, the 12th of November. Uh, and it's a panel discussion again. Uh, this time it's with uh, academic experts. So we've got uh, Dr. Ruth Smith and Jonathan Keats, both of whom have written extensively about the piece, and we'll be joined by Lawrence Cummings as well. Um, so, and you can book that, you should have received a link for that, or you can go onto our website and look. It's all free, but we do ask you to pre-register, and rather like today, you'll get the Zoom link on the day, um, and I look forward to seeing you all then. But um, please feel free to gracefully exit the call now thank you so much great to see you all okay. people from abroad bye bye
Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.